We are more than a location. We are more than a building. We are the people of God. We live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are Cleveland Baptist. For more information about our church and our live streams, head over to www.clevelandbaptist.com. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to have you with us for our Sunday night service. So glad that we can spend this time together and just looking into God's word. Let's look to the Lord in prayer before we open the scriptures. Father, we thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, we thank you for sending the spirit. Thank you for your promise that the Holy Spirit would be a teacher. And for 2,000 years, he has been teaching your followers. We need him tonight. And I just pray tonight that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher as we open the word and that he would reveal the things that you want us to see and we'd be encouraged and equipped for living through another week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in the Christian life, there are many things that we can do. There are things we might regard as handy, useful, interesting, things that we could invest our time into. But then there's another category. There are things that we ought to do. There are things that we must do. These things are essential. We'd be very unwise to neglect these things. We are wise to invest quality and quantity time into them. And one of these, in fact, right up there with any other of the highest priorities that God gives us is to pray. Yes, the vital cutting edge ministry of prayer. There is a pressing need for you and me to be at prayer. Is it something that you sense in your life that there is, it's an essential, we must be praying, not only that it's something that would be good to do, but it's something that we need to do. Prayer is not just handy. Prayer is not just a pleasant little devotional exercise that we can engage in. No, it's more. It is urgent that we pray. The circumstances demand it, and the Bible compels us to pray. And as well as that, the Holy Spirit within the believer is wanting to agitate prayer. He's wanting to generate prayer within us. Make no mistake, every follower of Jesus is called and commanded to pray. pray prayer is such a vital component of the Christian life. We need it as individuals, as married couples, as families, and we need it collectively as churches. The Bible not only points us in the direction of prayer by giving us some commands about prayer and, and, and us finding statements about prayer, it provides inspiring examples of prayer. Just think of some of the great praying people in the Bible. Moses, Hannah, Samuel, David, Elijah and Daniel, Mary, Paul, with Jesus, of course, being the supreme example Jesus being the consummate man of prayer. And then as we work through the Bible, we find an emphasis on collective prayer in the early church. Acts chapter 1, they're praying. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 12, the believers are praying together. And then Paul has a lot to say about prayer in his letters. James and Peter and Jude also speak of prayer. And then when we get to the very last book of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 5, we're given this stunning vision of heaven. And what do we find? We find golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Doesn't that show us the great value that God places on our prayers? Prayer is so important that Jesus actually taught his disciples how to pray. We don't read of him teaching them how to preach or how to run programs, but he taught them how to pray. So we could go to a number of texts tonight from the word of God to get some encouragement. Let's just go to one verse tonight from Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to focus our attention on Colossians 4 verse 2. Let's read that verse together. Continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Let's, let's really park ourselves in this text tonight and just think about what Paul is saying and let the Lord speak to us. Just before we do, let's just briefly consider the context. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to the Colossians, 
which was one of the churches planted in a region within what is now modern-day Turkey. It's regarded to be one of Paul's prison epistles written by him and Timothy, and it's generally believed that he wrote this while he was imprisoned in Rome. The situation was that there was some false teaching circulating, and so Paul warns the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Yes, there were false teachers doing the rounds, and they posed a threat. Their teachings were harmful to the spiritual health of the Christians. So what Paul does is he warns them, but then he lifts Jesus up. It's a very Christ-exalting letter, and he just points out Jesus is sufficient. You don't need these other philosophies. And then in the midst of a number of encouragements he gives, we find this one in Colossians 4. So this time we're going to read it again, but we'll read verse 2, 3, and 4 just to get um, the emphasis here on prayer. Colossians 4 from verse 2, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So he urges them to pray in verse 2, and then he requests them to pray for him in verse 3 and 4. So let's return now to verse 2 and just spend our time tonight focusing on this really punchy call to prayer. Firstly, continue earnestly in prayer. This is a directive. This is an imperative. This is not mere advice. Paul is not giving some tips. He is urging the believers to pray. Paul, who himself was a man of prayer, and he knew the need for prayer and the power of prayer, he knew that they needed to pray. So he urges them here and then talks about the nature of praying they needed to engage in. Let's have a look at the first four words of this verse in four different Bible translations, just to really get the emphasis here. Firstly, the ESV renders it, continue earnestly in prayer. The NIV has, devote yourselves to prayer. The New King James, continue earnestly in prayer. And if you go to the Greek interlinear, it's in prayer, continue steadfastly. So you'll notice that in Greek, the words in prayer are at the start of the sentence. They are in the prominent position in the sentence. In prayer, Paul says, continue earnestly. Okay, let's go back to verse 2. This directive, continue steadfastly in verse 2, is in the plural So this is a directive to the entire church at Colossae. Paul is not just sending this to select individuals. It's not as if, you know, there was just a few elite prayers in the church who needed uh, uh, some, you know, bit of a pep talk. No, this is directed to the church. So it's, it's not a scenario where uh, people at Colossae should be thinking, well, yes, we've got some men and women of prayer in our church, and they do the praying around here. You know, me, I teach Sunday school, and other people lead Bible studies and make cups of tea, but we've got a group who are the prayer warriors, and they are the ones who just do the praying. No, this is written to the church, not a select few. Did you know, if we look at the five passages in the New Testament on spiritual gifts, you will not find a spiritual gift of intercessory prayer. It is absent from all five lists of spiritual gifts. Why? Because it's for every believer. Not everybody was called to be an apostle or a prophet or a preacher or to have the gifts of helps and and faith and so on. But all the believers at Colossae needed to continue steadfastly in prayer. This term, uh, continue steadfastly, is actually one word, continue steadfastly, Uh, H.M. Carson in his commentary describes it as engaging in prayer with diligence and persistence. It has this idea of being attentive to prayer and persevering in prayer. It's being intently engaged in it, valuing it highly and persevering in this discipline. Are you a follower of Jesus tonight? You need to be praying. I need to be praying. We need to take prayer seriously and not be casual about this. We need to be relentless in prayer. Now, as with many directives in the Bible, it's good for us 
to stop and ask why. Not, not challenging what the Bible says, but it's good to ask, well, why would Paul say this? And just think, get behind it and think about, are there some really compelling reasons to continue earnestly in prayer? Let's zoom out, but think biblically. Firstly, I want to put to you uh, three reasons why Paul would say such a thing. The first thing is the Christian church began with this mindset. So a fundamental reason to take Paul seriously is that the early church continued faithfully, earnestly in prayer. So he's not calling on the Colossians to be innovative or to do something new. It's a call to just get in the flow of what the first Christians did. And this phrase, continue earnestly, you find it in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, that all the believers were of one accord, devoting themselves to prayer. It's the same phrase, same word. Then the church grew to over 3,000, and we find in Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves to prayer. Again, it's the same word. And then in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, the apostles said, look, we will devote ourselves to prayer. Same word again. So Paul is calling believers not to do something that hadn't been done, but just to get in the flow of what had been happening in the lively early church where they did continue steadfastly in prayer. It's a call to carry the baton, and the baton is now in our hands. It's time for us to be continuing steadfastly in prayer. Let's walk in the footsteps of the early church. You know, another reason why we need to heed Paul's exhortation here is, friends, there's a war on. Are you aware of that? There's a war on. They were not at a picnic. They were in a spiritual battle. We are not at a picnic. We are not on a luxury cruise. The Christian life is not a nonstop party. There is a great cosmic conflict going on, the forces of darkness versus God and his angelic forces. We don't wrestle against people. We wrestle against these dark spiritual forces, and the battle is happening right now. It's happening in your town, in your city, right now. Satan is at work. He's trying to disrupt and destroy and create mayhem everywhere. He's a deceiver. He is clever. He is sinister. And he is cruel. And he is seeking to hinder God's purposes. He will assault Jesus' church. He'll actually line up local churches that are being effective. And he will get out the big guns and assault those churches. He attacks individuals. Oh, yes, some of you don't need any persuading. You know it. You know it, that Satan and his forces line up individual Christians and really try to kneecap them and take them out of the battle. And he's got thousands of years' experience. He's got an array of tricks and seductions and deceptions up his sleeve, and there have been many casualties. Many have gone down. Make no mistake, he wants to take you down. He wants to take me down. So he will have a go at the individual, and he'll have a go at the local church. Peter said to Christians that the devil roars around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to cuddle. No, seeking someone to devour. Yes, he means business. So it's no coincidence, if we go to Ephesians 6, that well-known passage on spiritual armor, it's no coincidence that immediately after describing the armor and telling the believers to take up the sword, the next thing he does is urges them to pray. And you will find... In Ephesians 6, verse 18, there's four references to prayer packed into one verse. Praying at all times, with all prayer and supplication. Keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. Yes, we need to pray. And the switched on Christian, they're aware of the spiritual battle. They are conscious that we are not living in peacetime. So they are not comatose in front of their TV all day. They don't spend half their day staring at their phone. They don't pursue childish things. They are switched on, alert, and they live like there's a battle. You'll find them walking around with their armor on. They've got the scriptures in their head. They've got the scriptures in their heart. They've memorized verses of scripture. They live in the atmosphere of prayer. They are the praying kind. And they're the kind of Christians we need in the times that we are living in. It's not time to be casual. It's time to be ready 
and actively engage in the battle through prayer. John Piper said this, I have often said that one of the reasons we feel so weak in our prayer lives is we have tried to make a domestic intercom out of a wartime walkie-talkie. Prayer is not designed as an intercom between us and God to serve the domestic comforts of the saints. It is designed as a walkie-talkie for spiritual battlefields. Paul was very aware of the battle, so he could say from experience and with conviction, continue earnestly in prayer. Thirdly, another reason we need to do this, another reason this encouragement was needed, is that sometimes continued prayer is needed before there's a breakthrough. Not all answers to prayer come quickly. If you ask any seasoned prayer, anyone who's a prayer warrior with years and even decades behind them of prayers and answers to prayer, they will testify that not all their prayers were answered within 24 hours. Strongholds often do not come down in 10 minutes. Breakthroughs are often preceded by weeks, months, and even years of prayer. Jesus told his disciples the parable of the persistent widow with the purpose that they would pray and not faint. Jesus said to ask, seek, knock. There's an escalation there in intensity. So when it comes to prayer, sometimes we've got to set ourselves for the long haul and we need discipline and determination and tenacity until the answer comes. William Miller served as a missionary in Iran for 43 years. And he told the story of a devout Christian man named Dr. Ibrahim. And Dr. Ibrahim prayed for 50 years for his mother to come to Christ and be baptized. Imagine that. Imagine praying for someone for half a century. I think that qualifies as long haul praying. After praying all that time, she was wonderfully saved. William Miller was invited to the home of the doctor. He went there with several elders of the church. And this lady was sitting there in a chair, over 90 years of age, nicely dressed, all ready to be baptized. And she was so deaf, he had to shout questions in her ear. Do you believe in Christ as your Savior? Do you want to be baptized in his name? Yes, yes, she replied. Praise God, there are great breakthroughs that happen, but sometimes only after prolonged, disciplined prayer. So that's another reason we need the exhortation to continue steadfastly in prayer. The answers do not always come quickly. So let's quickly revise. Why do we need to obey this directive? The early church did. There's a battle going on and some breakthroughs only occur after continued prayer. Are you up for it? Are you ready for a life of faithful prayer? And I just don't want to give the impression tonight that praying is just something that we ought to do and therefore it's a dry duty. That is not the case. Again, you ask anyone who's a man or woman of prayer and they will tell you it's a delight. Praying is not a chore. It's a delight to just spend time communing with our Father, spend some time worshipping Him in adoration and thanksgiving and praise before we even move into fighting battles and interceding for others and making our requests. Oh, it's a delightful thing to thirst for God and just want to be in His presence and there we pray. Well, Paul doesn't stop there. If we have a close look at verse 2, the first four words is like his encouragement. The second half of the verse is about the kind of praying they needed to do. It. It's the, really the nature of the continual prayer they needed to engage in. So let's read the whole verse again. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. In other words, Paul's saying, look, as you do continue in prayer, make sure you're watchful. The New American Standard translates it, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. It has that idea. The Greek word has that idea of keeping awake, giving attention to something, being alert, and being vigilant. We cannot afford to be drowsy and sluggish in our Christian lives. We need to be in prayer. We need to be on the lookout for what's going on around us. That person needs prayer. That situation needs prayer. That church is under attack. 
And so we muscle up and we start to channel our prayers in that direction. And we knew what to pray for because we were watchful. Jesus used the same word when speaking to his disciples about his return. He said in, Mark, in Matthew 25, 13, Watch, for you know neither the day or the hour. It's exactly the same term used in Colossians 4, verse 2. It's all about paying attention to prayer. Let's think about the, the family for a moment. We, we've thought briefly about Satan, how he will have a go at individuals, he'll have a go at local churches. But it's just on my heart today to think about this verse in relation to the family. Satan has designs for the family as well. He is attacking the family unit today and he will line up individual families, strong Christian families, and trying to disrupt them and cause mayhem and misery in those families. Do you believe that? Do you believe that to be true? He is seeking whom he may devour. So he wants to take families down. And if he can't take the whole family down, he'll get one member of the family to go way off the rails and cause sorrow to the rest of the family and even paralyze the family. The Christian parent who is alert to this engages in prayer. They're aware of it. They pray. They put a hedge around their family. They believe in God for protection. They believe in God for victories. And they really keep watch. Just as God told Ezekiel, I've made you a watchman for Israel. They see themselves as a watchman for their own family. So they intercede for their family members. And not just as things come to mind, they, they even have an organized system. Monday, I'm going to pray for my oldest son. Tuesday, I'm going to pray for my second child. Wednesday, I'm praying for my wife. Thursday, I'm just going to pray generally for our family. And they have a, a system even where they are totally organized and vigilant in praying for their family. We need this today. We need praying fathers. I want to say today to the men, to you men, we need to man up and we need to pray for our families. It's not time for us men to be slouchers, kicking back, thinking the church work will be done by the women. We need to man up and step up to the plate in leadership, in knowledge of the word, in holy living and in prayer. We need to do that. Mothers, oh, what a vital role you have to be praying, to be sowing the seed among the children and then watering that seed with prayer. We need this today. And of course, praying grandparents, what a blessing they are too. Satan will have a go at our families and our children. He'll try and attack them, seduce them, lure them away from the church, disillusion them with Christianity, get them into relationships with non-Christians that lead to marriages, which lead to heartbreak. He will do all these things. We need to step up and pray for our families. Prayer is not a guarantee that there'll be no problems or that no one will make a wrong decision or backslide, but it's a very big help to keeping things together and having optimum spiritual health. God forbid that we should be slumped back in our lounge chairs watching foolish American sitcoms while Satan is attacking our families. And we're in some kind of spiritual hibernation like a sleeping bear in a cave. And we're laughing along with society while society's on the broad road leading to destruction when we ought to be switched on when it comes to prayer. Oh, how vigilant some of us are to make for sure our phone is switched on, but maybe we're not switched on to the battle and all that's going on. Now, this concept of being watchful, being watchful in prayer, I want to put it to you today that this is not just crisis praying. This is preemptive praying. We need to pray for our families when things are going well. Not, not just waiting until someone gets onto drugs or someone gets into a bad relationship and then thinking, right, there's a crisis. I better start praying. I better start praying. Now that my 15-year-old is having these massive problems, I need to start praying. Why not start praying when they're one? Why, why not get in before the devil and start praying preemptively? We need to do that. I think if we did more preemptive praying, we'd have less crisis praying to do. May God help us to be alert to this need. Let's move now to the last part of the verse. Something else about the nature of the praying that the Colossians needed to do, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. You know, thanksgiving is an attitude, isn't it? It's not, not just words that come from our mouth. A thankful heart brings forth words of gratitude to God. And isn't it a good thing 
to have an attitude of gratitude. And it's, it's pleasing to the Lord when we have a thankful spirit. And it just flavors our prayers. It permeates our prayers. And we're bringing our prayers to God. We don't just rush to making requests. We thank God for who he is. We thank Father, thank you for what you've done. I thank you for your favor. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for your daily provisions. I thank you for my family, for my church, for my school. I thank you for my circumstances. I thank you for my trials. I thank you in advance for answers to prayer. Oh, there's so much to be thankful for. It's a great thing when thankfulness is just permeating our prayers and, and praying itself becomes more enjoyable when this is the nature of our praying. And, and it's so encouraging to go to a prayer meeting and you haven't just got everybody moaning about their sore knees and arthritis and the whole prayer meeting is just taken up with bodily ailments. And there is a time to pray for some of these things, but God forbid that these things should just swamp and smother our prayer meetings when these are occasions for thanksgiving. And it's great to go to a prayer meeting where this person's giving thanks and that person's giving thanks and we think, wow, there's a lot of thanksgiving going on around here. That's a really positive thing that lifts our spirits. May God help us to be thankful in our praying. Jesus is the consummate prayer and he was thankful. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus said publicly, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus prayed, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. He has set the example. It will sweeten the whole experience of prayer if we have a thankful heart. So we could say on the authority of God's word here in Colossians 4 verse 2, again, this, this is not just a tip from Paul. It's not just a suggestion. It is God's will that we continue earnestly in prayer. It is God's will that that praying be of the watchful kind and that it be flavored with thanksgiving. Friends, we've got some praying to do. Oh, what a vital activity this is. This is the season for prayer. We're moving into winter now. It's the season for putting on warm clothes. It's the season for getting the doona out again. And it's the season where a lot of football players are hoping that the rugby league season and the AFL season will restart because this is football season. It's not cricket season. There are no interstate or international matches going on at the MCG or the SCG because cricket is in the off-season. And when it comes to prayer, we are always in season. There is never an off-season. This is the time to be at prayer. Tomorrow we will need to pray. The next day we will need to pray. As winter, as autumn becomes winter and winter becomes spring and we roll around to summer and back to autumn again, they will still be seasons for prayer. It doesn't matter where you are watching from tonight, you are in a place where you need to be praying. You are in a season where there is a pressing need to pray. Many are the rewards if we will discipline ourselves to do this. There's immediate, the immediate rewards of enjoying God's presence and then the wonderful reward of a harvest of answers to prayer because God is a prayer answering God. Now, there may be someone uh, watching tonight who's joined us who is not yet a Christian. You're very welcome to have joined us tonight. I'm just delighted that you are viewing from wherever you are tonight. And I just want to speak directly to you tonight for a few moments. God's desire for you is not that you stumble around living life your way. That's not his plan for you. He wants to save you from your sins. He wants to save you from yourself and from slavery to sin. He wants to open your eyes to the fact that he is a holy God and you have sinned against him and are therefore rightfully under the judgment of God, but that he loved you enough to send a rescuer. He sent Jesus Christ down to die on the cross for the sins of humankind and he wants to save you. It won't do for you to say tonight, I'm okay, I'm a good person. That is to defy the word of God, which says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He wants to save you and transform you into a prayer, so you become the praying kind. 
How can you be saved tonight? The gospel message is simple, that Jesus Christ died on the cross as your substitute and you need to repent and believe. You need to turn from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ, taking him as your personal saviour. Here is a promise from Romans chapter 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I encourage you tonight, call out. He will save you and you begin a great adventure as a child of God and a man or woman of prayer. Please do that tonight. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, please help us tonight to have a very acute awareness of where we are in history, the battle that is going on around us, and the necessity of us taking prayer seriously. Help us to be really switched on to that tonight. Please forgive us for any times we've been casual and neglectful regarding prayer. Sorry, Lord. Please stir us afresh to be vigilant in prayer and to have those delightful times with you and help, I just want to finish by praying again for the fathers, all the fathers tuning in tonight. Help us to be vigilant in keeping watch over our families, manning up and praying for them. Help us, Lord. We're weak. We need you. But as we pray in the Spirit, we can be confident of answers to prayer. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Have a great week. Let's be faithful in prayer this week.